Hi, I'm Barry Williams from Pixel Fantastic in London. At this post house, we produce a lot of 3D programs for the mainstream broadcasters, and uh, we found that the quality of programs coming through in 3D that are studio based have been absolutely incredible, getting better every time. We've also noticed that uh, cinematographers are becoming more adventurous and uh, perhaps taking rigs at the top of trees in rainforests and down canyons and putting them on the back of racing cars. So those shots really need a lot more correction. And although we can correct problems in shots that uh, have misalignment in this direction, as soon as the camera becomes misaligned in uh, the vertical, then we have a real issue because foreground items perhaps might be too high in the frame, so we want to move them down, but we can't because items at the back are already too far down and if we move them down further they become even more unwatchable. So really what you want is a DVE which says I'll identify this area, move it up and I'll identify this area and move it down and uh, perhaps move the centre uh, in a different direction. But that would involve warping, morphing and DVEs. That basically is what Dimension does. It analyzes the frame and says this area is wrong in this direction on a pixel by pixel basis it'll move it to where it should be and at the same time it'll move this area in another direction on a pixel by pixel basis but it will then morph in between the two. So you end up with a frame which was very unwatchable and it results in a frame which is completely watchable with proper 3D integrity. Another problem we're seeing regularly is unsynced cameras. That's not a mistake, sometimes people use GoPros and things like that as crash cameras and they are not synced electronically. So if you photograph something which is very fast moving, because they're not in the same time space each, uh, then perhaps you have an explosion of uh, particles and individual particles are moving at different times in the frame. So what you really need to do is have one dV per particle and move them back together so they become pairs again. A thousand dVEs perhaps on one frame. Again, that is what Dimension effectively is doing. It's looking at the particles and saying, well, they belong together as pairs and moving them into position. It's an absolute miracle what it's doing and it's enabled us to fix frames which I would have thought would have been completely unrepairable. And finally, we're seeing quite a few shots which are over depth. They're just too wide to watch. And what we really would like to do is to bring them together. Unfortunately, that's not possible. What we really want to do is to take the left eye and right eye and say, well, we really should have put a camera in between the two. Well, what Dimension does is it will allow you to reconstruct a completely new camera that didn't exist by analysing the left and the right and then making another frame, which is the basis of halfway in between the two. And you can control how far left and how far right that camera goes. It really is a work of genius and has enabled us to fix incredibly bad shots. It's not acceptable to check 3D programs by eye. The broadcasters don't check by eye. They use scopes like this, which analyze every frame. And the reason for that is, of course, that the convergence puller might be changing the convergence through a shot. So if you spot check, you might miss uh, something going completely out of spec and coming back in. So that's how we know that once we fix something with dimension, it is absolutely watchable in 3D because we can actually see the whole thing in 3D space on the scopes. We use Dimension all the time. It's enabled us to fix shots which have been unfixable on any other system we own. And I'm so pleased to have it as part of our toolkit. There are two categories of tools in Dimension, the disparity set and the optical flow set. The disparity set of tools works with disparity and stereo images. The optical flow tools work with sequential images. There are also utilities that work with both sets. Some existing tools inside Fusion deal with stereo and vector channels, and I'll explain those a bit later. First, let's have a look at disparity. In all stereoscopic camera original shots, you will be working with two image streams, commonly known as left and right. To use any of Dimension's specific tools, the first tool you'll require is the disparity tool. To generate the disparity map, of the differences between the two images. Once the disparity is calculated, it's embedded into the extra channels, as seen easily in Fusion's extended channel viewer system. Here I'm viewing the disparity X differences. The disparity tool has two different methods of generating the disparity results. They're very accurate in working out the results of the differences between the images. There is an advanced set of controls that have been preset 
to give the best results in their default settings. We suggest you write the disparity results out to an intermediate format like EXRs, which can store the images and the disparity data. ION offers a group of render nodes for use on a render farm or other computers to expedite this process. Once you have an intermediate format, the other disparity tools are very quick and interactive. In this example, I'm using the same images as before, but I stack them as a stereo pair before I pipe them into the disparity tool. I'll then save them out as a stacked image. The result is still disparity creation, but I'm simply showing two available methods depending on what you're most comfortable with. Now it's time to take stereoscopic control. I now have our left and right images with their embedded disparity. If you put on your anaglyph glasses, I'll begin with alignment, which can actually be completed using two different methods. The new eye tool takes the disparity and allows me to use a method of alignment and eye separation as if you were using real 3D space. First, you can see there's a difference in Y, the height. So, I'm going to align my right image in the Y axis only to be the equal height of my left image through an interactive Y slider adjustment. Now I'll control my left image alignment so that there's no stereo, as it completely matches the right image. I'll put it back to the left image. The same alignment control is possible with the right image adjustment. I could move that all the way to the left image and back again. You also have the ability to hyperextend the results by entering any value beyond the slider's controls. In this example, I have two images with an exposure difference between them. It's important to note that prior to creating the disparity map, you should always match camera exposures as closely as possible. Exposure differences are the inevitable reality of shooting, especially through a mirror rig. So in this case, I'll use the color corrector's histogram and its match option. This will use the left image as a reference and match its levels to the right image, so the results will have the same color range. Once matched, I'll generate the disparity map and you can see the disparity here. Again, I'll make an adjustment in the new eye tool, just to see how far the separation is between the eyes. Now I'll pipe in a disparity to Z tool combined with the camera input and create a Z buffer depth map. That means I can now take the stereo scene into full 3D space using a displacement tool and I have the ability to actually extrude that image into real 3D space. I'll view this in an anaglyph view once again and use my camera to create the eye separation and change the convergence distance. This can be done in toe in or parallel. Let's have a look at the next example. The Stereo Align tool, as its name depicts, has a number of on-screen interactive alignment options. In this default setup, take notice, the height on the head is different as seen easily in the anaglyph view. In this case, I'll use the Global Y Alignment option in the Stereo Align tool. I'll view the upstream disparity and manually pick the height in the Align tool using the top of the head as my alignment reference point. When I jump back to the anaglyph view, I've matched the height. Of course, I can control and adjust the convergence point and the stereo separation of the image. Using the new eye tool on the same footage, I can do something similar. If I make the right eye the height of the left by unlocking the X and Y differences and mapping the right eye all the way to the left eye's height, I can also adjust the stereo eye separation of the right eye independently of the left eye. Take note, the adjustment does not stretch the image, but rather it does occlusion filling from the other eye. If you look at the detail here, you'll see that as I move the eye separation from one eye to the next, it actually picks up details and fills in space behind the object. Dimension achieves this by mapping the difference from each eye into the opposite eye. In this example, we have the images shot with a wide angle lens on each camera through a mirror rig. There's polarization differences from the reflections in the water as well as barrel distortion from the lens. So as previously mentioned, I'll align the color first using the color corrector's histogram match feature. The stereo pair already has disparity embedded in the sources, so I'm immediately able to utilize 
the stereo align tool to achieve precise and exact warping. In this case, I need to solve the alignment on a per pixel basis. Let's view the warp in, and now we'll take the warp out. Now my left image and right image contain the equal amount of warp. Once the image has been manipulated to that point, I need to regenerate the disparity again, and using the new eye tool, I'll reconstruct the right image by creating it out of the left. The source frames and warp direction allows me to use the left image with its vector and turn it into the same warp as the right image. Let's view the original left image and now the right image based on the same color and warp parameters as the left. In this final example, I'll use the disparity map to fix problems with defocus between the cameras. Here, we have a right image that had the lens slightly defocused during the shoot. Using the new eye tool, I can reconstruct a new eye by remapping the left eye. I'll load the original right eye, and now the reconstructed new right eye. The result, I now have the same sharp focus in the right eye as the left eye. Now let's look at the optical flow. The optical flow generator, which also does the heavy lifting, looks at sequential frames and generates vectors of the flow of pixels between those images. Let's have a look at an optical flow workflow. In this example, we have footage of a monkey climbing in a tree. The first thing we need to do is generate the optical flow. The optical flow creates a series of back vectors and forward vectors between the two adjacent frames. This data lets us know how the pixels are flowing between the series of frames. Once generated, we can then go into flow speed to retime the footage. The optical flow has two different methods of generating vector results that are very accurate in working out what's happening in the flow of pixels between the images. There is an advanced set of controls that have been preset to give the best results in their default settings. While this workflow is rather simple, made up of just four tools, we suggest you write the optical results out to an intermediate format like EXRs. This format can store images and the vector data. Once you have the intermediate format, the optical flow tools are very quick and interactive. Using the flow speed, we have now slowed this footage down five times. The other tool is the flow stretcher, which uses a spline to do non-linear speed changes. Here, we're going to have it very slow, speeding up, and right at the end, slow down again. Let's have a look at the results. A closer look at these time-based tools show that the interpolation method in these tools have the choices of nearest, blend, and flow. The flow method uses the vectors that we pre-generated to create the in-between frames. There are four checkboxes under the Source Frame and Warp Directions heading. What this means is that they use the previous frame with the forward vector and the next frame with its forward vector to create the in-between. These two results will be blended together. We can also use the previous frame with the back vector and the next frame with its back vector as well. Or we can use all four results that can get blended together to receive our final result. Depending on your footage, you may have to experiment with combinations to achieve the desired results. The next item is depth ordering. You have a choice between the slowest vectors on top or the fastest vectors on top. This is used to determine which parts of the frame need to be on top of the others. As parts of the image will overlap, this parameter controls the overlap rendering. In our example, the monkey is moving, but the vectors are actually moving from the tilt from the camera, which is happening very slowly. The slowest vectors will be the ones that we use on top, and the monkey's vectors will sit below. Two additional tools that use the optical flow method are the Repair Frame and the Tween tool. The Repair Frame tool looks at sequential frames and repairs frame contaminants like dust and scratches. For example, we have a single scratch on this frame, so if we navigate there, 
we can use the repair frame and that will fill in the difference from the forward and back frames and remove the scratch. The repair frame self generates the optical flow directly and uses blend between the previous and next frame using the forward vectors and the previous and next frame using the back vectors. Depth ordering choices are fastest or slower on top. A similar tool is the tween tool and it can be used to generate a frame that's completely missing out of the sequence. For example, we have frame 1 and frame 3 and we want to create frame 2. The tween tool solves this by looking at two frames and creates the in-between frame using the results of the optical flow data. The optical flow controls in the repair frame and tween use the same methods of deriving the vector data as in the standalone optical flow tools including the advanced controls. The primary difference is that the tween contains an interpolation slider that allows for nonlinear control of the warp from frame 0, the frame before, and frame 1, the frame after. A practical example of its use is if there were a sync difference on two cameras that is not a full frame. We can solve that by using the tween tool to generate the adjustments with a nonlinear interpolation such as a half or quarter frame. With Dimension Tools, you also have the ability to combine Fusion's advanced tool set to create brand new functionality within your Fusion environment. I'd like to show you three examples of Dimension and Fusion teamed up together to solve complex problems and apply creative usage to imagery. Let's start with an image morph using the optical flow vectors which defines a per pixel mapping and can be used to morph one image to the next. Dimension can quickly create the morph maps between sequential stills. This allows me to pipe the result into Dimension's flow speed tool when the results of the vectors are slowed down and applied to the associated images. The transition result is a morph. This can also be applied to moving images and can be especially useful to repair jump cuts in editorial sequences. Our second example is provided by Fusion and Dimension artist Stefan Eiringer. Stefan and many artists regularly create and often contribute to ION's collaborative community providing numerous tools through our excellent SDK and open plugin architecture. Stefan's rolling shutter fuse fixes the issue of the rolling shutter artifact recorded by a CMOS sensor where each frame is recorded not from a snapshot of a single point in time but rather by scanning across the frame either vertically or horizontally. This produces an undesirable distortion of fast-moving objects that can be defined as skew or wobble. Stefan's plugin solves this using the backward motion vectors from Dimension's optical flow tool to calculate the source coordinates of each pixel. The adjustment of the necessary strength value is done by visual judgment, so I adjust the slider until the vertical image features are no longer slanted. If there are no vertical features, the rolling shutter fuse can render a temporary overlay that can be aligned to any straight image feature in a frame. If a scan line is being shifted more than half a frame backwards in time, it makes sense to read pixels from the previous frame instead. There's a checkbox that will blend the current and previous frames. This helps improve the crispness of an image. For example, if there's different amounts of motion blur in the top and bottom part of the image, in addition to the rolling shutter artifacts. In this example, we'll demonstrate stabilization which utilizes motion vectors as opposed to tracking data to achieve the result. This footage was shot using a Canon consumer camera. We took the original H.264 file and calculated an optical flow from the footage. Once complete, we created an EXR file with the motion vectors embedded in it. Using the copy aux tool, the motion vectors were copied to the color channel the X vector to the red channel, and the Y vector to the green channel. The duplicate tool takes the green channel, the Y values, and adds them together. Take notice that the burn-in is set to 1, which internally composites all 35 frames. The actual stabilization uses an expression, and the color values are derived from the duplicate tool and applied to the transform, which executes the stabilization result without the use of a tracker. 
Dimension works brilliantly out of the box, yet combined with Fusion's incredible wealth of advanced and complete tools, modifiers, and expressions, you can create extended tools to solve complex post-production issues and produce brilliant, creative results. Just before we go to Q&A and address your questions, you should know that ION's next webinar series will focus on ION Fusion in the editing process, featuring ION Connection. Our special guest will be film editor and Fusion artist Alan Bell, who will discuss Fusion as part of his workflow for major blockbuster films. And with that, we're pleased to answer your questions.